Please turn to Genesis chapter 15. We are making our way through Genesis. We are looking at the whole chapter. Uh, The title of the message is Our Covenant God. And we see uh, this certainly presented here in Genesis 15. And uh, it is one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture, particularly the Old Testament. So follow along as I read Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half uh, over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And that, oh, sorry, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Ephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That is the word of the Lord. Why don't we turn to him in prayer now. Oh Lord, we... Thank you for your word, uh, because in it we find the truth of everlasting life. In it we find Jesus Christ, uh, who is our living water, who is our bread of life. And so, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would illumine Christ to us, uh, even in this text, as we look to behold wonderful things. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we would all agree uh, that particularly in our culture and right across the world, in fact, that lying has become commonplace. Uh, Lying from our politicians to our leaders to the media. Uh, I think if if our leaders did not lie, we would become very skeptical and we'll think, are you telling the truth? In fact, it was the philosopher Plato uh, who said that, no, a leader should be able to lie. In fact, they have the right to lie. He said this, if anyone at all is to have the privilege of lying, the rulers of the state should be the persons and they in their dealings, either they're with enemies or with their own citizens may be allowed to lie for the public good. The question I ask is who determines the public good? The leaders, right? And it pays off to lie. Um, But we must acknowledge that uh, politicians lie because they know that by lying, they can discredit their um, opponents. 
uh, by lying, they can get themselves out of potential corruption or crime. And we don't want to think, though, that the politicians are the only liars. Uh, Because studies have come out that, on average, people lie up to two times a day, if not more. Two times a day. And you think, well, that's that's a lot. Um, Well, it actually works out well to lie. Uh, It might protect us from difficult situations, like your wife comes and says, how's my dress? (laughs) It's beautiful, right? Um, Or you might lie to... um, uh, to stay home and say that you're sick. Uh, You might lie on your tax return because you believe that by lying, uh, you can gain more money. Uh, You might lie when someone uh, comes up to you and says their name and you don't remember them and say, "Um, of course I remember you. You know, lying benefits us. That's why we lie. We lie because we've got a sin nature, but we do lie uh, because we think it benefits us and we might um, sort of push those, those lies aside as white lies uh, because they're not really that big an issue. That, that is where God is so different from us. You see, God doesn't lie. God will never deceive you, no matter what. He, he doesn't need to lie. He doesn't need to lie to try and garner your vote. No, he just simply tells it how it is. And he's okay with that. And he knows that what he says is right and true and is the most right and good thing. He's always dependable. The lyrics of that hymn that we learnt last week help us understand this. That hymn, whatever my God ordains is right. It says, whatever my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know he will not leave me. God not only does not lie, but he actually makes promises to us in the form of covenants, that's agreements, to, in a sense, bind his hands to ensure that he does that tells the truth. But that's not for God's need, because God doesn't need to lie, and he would never lie or go against his nature, but it's more for us, who so often doubt God's goodness and doubt God's word, and God says, here, here's a sign, here's a contract to show that I will fulfill all that I promise to fulfill. In this text this morning, we have two characters at play. There is... Abram, and then there is God. And I was quite intrigued at at how passive Abram is and how active God is in this passage. And Abram in in, in this text shares his heartfelt doubts about God, almost like a child going to his father. And it shows the truthfulness of the Lord who promises things. You have God meeting Abram's concerns with immense patience and care by giving him unbreakable promises that Abram can hold on to. There is the interplay between the covenant-making God and the believer in Christ who is called to walk by faith and not by sight, believing in the promises of God, trusting in them alone. This is the interplay we're seeing here in our text this morning. And the meta-narrative, I guess, overarching all this is that Abram is promised offspring and he's promised a land. And the main lesson I want to bring this morning is that God brings salvation to his people that they might live by faith in his covenant promises guaranteed by his blood despite delay and difficulty. That's a long statement, but you'll see it unfold through the message. The structure of our passage is quite simple. It really is two halves. You see, God come to Abram and he makes a promise. Abram comes and says, God, I don't know if I believe that. And then God ensures that promise will be kept by giving him a sign. Firstly, there is the doubt over the offspring, and God gives him a sign by saying, look up to the stars. Secondly, there is the doubt over the land, and God 
makes a sign by create, cutting a covenant with him. And right between these two little accounts, you have the statement, that wonderful statement, and Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so we're going to look at this passage at four aspects of what it means that we have a covenant God over us, guiding us, fulfilling his promises for us, and how we are to live in light of that. All right, so let's look at the first point here. Our covenant God meets us in our fears and doubts with assurance. Notice verse 1. It says, after these things. Now, if you have not been around in the last number of weeks, you might say, well, what are are these things? Uh, If you can remember that these things are that uh, Abram uh, went north and overthrew the four kings that had come down and taken Lot and the possessions away, and he overthrew them and, and had victory. Then when he came down, he was met by the king of Salem and the king of Solom, so, uh, Sodom, I should say. And, uh, and he was offered, uh, so you had a spiritual victory against the kings and then a, sorry, a physical victory and then a spiritual victory against the king of Sodom who offered him his goods um, at the expense of um, God's testimony. So after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. And you might ask, what what would Abram be fearing right now? I mean, he's he's been very successful. Perhaps he was fearing that uh, the kings of the north would come down and take him again. It's not no small thing that he has overthrown these. They could gather their troops and come down and seek out Abram, no doubt. Um, Maybe he was fearing that he just gave the opportunity up to have all the possessions of Sodom. How will I make it in the days ahead? There could have been those things, but I think there is something deep in um, Abram's heart that he's fearing. Remember he left Ur the Chaldeans when Sarah was barren. He entered Canaan in barrenness. He went down to Egypt in barrenness. He came up out of Egypt back into Canaan in barrenness. All the while, years are going on. The fulfillment of the promise of God has not uh, not come to pass. There has been children, no doubt, born into his house and taking hold of him, saying, Uncle um, Abram, only a reminder that I'm living in barrenness. Where is my child? The deep fear that maybe there is no biological heir. And if Adam, uh, sorry, Adam, Abram had have died by the kings, how would the fulfillment of the promises have occurred? And he's thinking life's very temperamental. So God, who knows the longings of our own hearts, speaks to Abram with a word of promise. And he says this, I am your protection and I'll grant you provisions. Great provisions. Do not fear. I think we all suffer from fear and discouragement. And the great antidote when we are in anxiety is the word of God. When God comes to Abram in his fears and how we need to be going to the word of God in our fears. And yet it doesn't seem to mitigate Abram's fears, does it? He doesn't seem to be satisfied with that word from God for he says, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? And that's a bit of an understatement. What what will you give me? I mean, Abram, you are probably one of the most richest men in Canaan right now. But it's no good having success if you have no successor. And he said, "What, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring and a member of my house will be my heir. What's going on here? It's it's a well-known custom that if uh, a man does not have his own heir, his own children, that he would choose someone from his household, and this uh, Eliezer, the, the servant, to be a man who would bury Abram when he dies, uh, but also would carry on the name of Abram be that heir and take on his goods and name. But Abram, despite massive success in his life up to this point, 
despite a close relationship with God, feels that a successor is so important. It's necessary. And I think what Abram's doing here, he's not showing a lack of faith by saying, God, why don't you give me a child? I actually think he is pressing in for faith. He's going to the very one who he knows is responsible for this. And I think we, as God's children, show exceeding faith when we come to God with honest hearts, seeking answers in our most difficult questions. Lord, why this cancer? Why have you granted that I should bear this burden? Why have you taken my son away? What I had this. Everyone else seems to get on fine. This is the lament of the Psalms. Why do you hide yourself from me in my need, Psalm 10? Why have you forgotten me, Psalm 42? Why do the wicked prosper, Psalm 73? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, on the words of the Lord Jesus, why, Lord, why, Lord, why, Lord? Children of God are called to ask the Lord why, for answers, for clarity. We might not get the answer, but we are to press in in faith. And God, by his grace, meets Abram's why with another word. And he says, verse 4, this man doesn't even name Eliezer, this man. He's not even on the, my radar, Abram. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. The, the, the Hebrew is um, the, the, the one who comes out of your loins, your bowels, should be your heir. And you think that this might mitigate all doubt, right? It's going to come from you, Abram. But we don't know if it's going to come from Sarai. And we're gonna, they're going to struggle with this in the next few chapters when they think that there's going to be someone else, right? Hagar. But leaving that aside, and Abram, no doubt, received a lot of joy and comfort in that, and God takes him out and says, I want you to look up to the stars. You just imagine a dark night, and they don't have the light pollution that we have. Have you ever been on a dark night in the middle of Australia, and you can see the Milky Way? It's, it's basically like a cloud. I mean, how many stars make that thing up? Billions. And he says, look, Abram, look up in the heavens. If you could count those stars, you'd be able to count your seed, your offspring. So great is going to be your offspring. Trust in me. Believe in me. Like, at this point, I think we need to encourage ourselves. And 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Honestly share your pains and your struggles and allow his word to strengthen you in your time of need. That is what we're called to do. Press into him. Rest in him. Trust in him. Secondly, our covenant God not only meets us in our doubts and gives us assurance, but our covenant God credits faith in his promises with righteousness. Verse 6 seems to describe the response Abram had to that revelation and confirmation. And it says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. That would mean that he is brought into relationship with God, savingly. And the question might be asked is, well, was Abram saved at this point? declared righteous or was he saved earlier and why is then this put here i think he was saved earlier i mentioned this when he came out of ur of the chaldeans in hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 it said that he left ur of the chaldeans in faith not knowing where he was going he was going to follow god wherever he would lead him and so i think that was saving faith he trusted in god and moved but also the 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 construction of the Hebrew here doesn't show sequence. Um, he showed him the stars and as a result of, or then he believed, it is quite a, um, a break, a firm break in the Hebrew. So it's this statement and then it's like, yes, and he believed God and it was counted for him as righteousness. So what's going on here? I think he was saved before, 
But I think Martin Luther is very helpful with what he says here. He says that it was because saving faith is one that focuses upon the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that Moses decided to put this statement here. Understand this. God told him, go outside, look up in the heavens and see the offspring. Abram understood that there was to be a seed that would come a Messiah who would crush the head of the serpent and bring salvation to his people. And it would come through his line. And so when he receives the confirmation that there will be offspring, that he understood that that offspring would be a Messiah. And Jesus, I think, affirms this when he says in John 8, 56, your father Abram rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So what is happening is that whatever Abram understood of God, he understood enough for save, to be saved, but the revelation be, became acute. It became so real that the Savior was coming and that he was to believe on him for salvation. What does this mean, declared righteous by faith? I want us to understand the nature of faith. If you're a believer or not a believer here, how am I to be saved to God? Faith requires, true saving faith requires propositional faith. What do I mean by propositional faith? It, it means that we are to believe on statements about God, who God is. It is to engage our mind. John, uh, sorry, uh, Paul helps us with this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's a statement. I've got to believe that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are propositions about God, that Jesus was not just simply a man born in uh, Nazareth, walking through Galilee, died a terrible death on the cross uh, at, at, the, at the hands of the Romans. No, I believe that he was a man sent by God. In fact, he was very God himself, as described in the scriptures, and that he lived a perfect life, and that when he death died, that was a death ordained by Almighty God for the salvation of the world as a provision for the world to save his own people. I believe statements about him. I believe I'm a, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I believe that Jesus can save me. And that when I believe the Holy Spirit comes and transforms me, it is engaging the mind. But to engage the mind's not enough. Because James in chapter 2 says, even the demons believe that God is one. You know, you think you know a lot about Jesus because of the word? Satan knows way more about Jesus. But is Satan saved? No, of course not. No, so we need to understand it's not we dispense with our intellect. We engage it, but it's not enough because then, it, then we need a personal faith. See, it says God called to Abram. God called to Abram, not to a general group, not to all those people in Mesopotamia to say, come with me. God put his finger on Abram and said, you, I need you. And that's the specific call of God when, he, when you hear the gospel preached that Jesus Christ came and died that you might repent and believe and you hear that, you might have heard it 10 times, but now you, it clicks. And what's happening is that God has put his finger on you and named you and you believe on him savingly. That's what, it, that's what we call being born again. It's propositional, I know about God. But if you've not moved to the personal, you're not saved. And you might say, yeah, I, I had this wonderful uh, mystical experience of Jesus, but is Jesus the one described in the scripture? If it's not, then you're not saved. We need both things. The Holy Spirit is to grip our heart in order to magnify Jesus Christ, to bring to your mind truths about Christ crucified and him raised again, and to loom into our heart and behold wonderful things of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
We see him in our, we understand him in our mind and we are gripped by him in our heart. We repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says we are saved. But the language he uses here, oh, sorry, and, I, and I'll just say that the third point is propositional. It's, pra, uh, it's um, personal, but it's also practical because then it transforms us. It transforms us. Um, Paul in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians 3 talks about Abram believing in God and it was counted to him for righteousness, justified. In James, he uses Abram as the example, but he then talks not as saving, not as faith, but he talks about works. And he said, how, how do you know that Abram was saved? How do you know that? Can't determine by what he says. Well, how you determine is because when God said, take your only son, the one in whom the weight of the world is on, Isaac, take him. Take him up to Mount Moriah, put a knife in his heart. Then I'll know you believe. And you know that what happened? He took him up and just about to thrust it into Isaac. And the Lord called out and said, stop. I know that you would do it. See, faith in God is very, very practical. It changes us. It transforms us. And then when God says, obey me, we say, yes, Lord. We do what he says. That's not to be saved, but that is the natural response of a renewed, regenerated heart. Propositional, it is personal, but then it is awfully practical. It is practical faith. And Abraham's belief, it said, was credited to him as righteousness. That's very important. Because if I ask you, are you 100% certain you would go to heaven when you die? What would you say? You ask the people on the street. When I've done that, so often they'll say, yes, I believe. And I say, on what basis? They say, I'm a good person. And see, what you're saying is that my good works will legally meet the requirement to get to heaven. God's standard. And what we're doing there is we are reducing God's standard to a little molehill where God's standard is above the heavens in terms of his holiness. And what we need to get to heaven is a righteousness, a holiness that meets that standard. How do we get that? The Bible says it's not through our own good works. It's not through our own works of righteousness, but it is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we have faith in him that he took my sins upon himself, then his holiness, his righteousness is accounted to us. It's legally stated. You can't get better than that. It is, we are justified by faith as he is our substitute. Legally declared righteous. And the most amazing thing here is that those in the Old Testament looked forward to the day when a Messiah would come and they were declared righteous by faith. They are saved just like you and I. Abrams and our relationship with God flourishes under the declaration of righteousness and sonship. It's not dependent upon your works. Friends, you might have come here pretty grumpy. You might have spared. You might have yelled at your kids. You are just as good as you are when you're at your best in God's sight. God knows it all. He's covered it all by his blood. Repent of those sins, but we are righteous in him even at our worst days. He meets us in our fears and doubts with assurance. He grants righteousness by faith. But thirdly, our covenant God affirms his promises with a signed contract. Notice this in verse 7. It says, And he said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. The Lord reminds Abram of the promise that he had. You, you leave Ur of the Chaldeans, I've brought you to this land to possess it. But again, Abram may have had a bit more confidence at this point. Comes again with his faulty, faltering questions and says, Oh Lord, how will I know that I'll possess it? We have these, don't we? Oh Lord, I know your word. I know what you say, but can you just give me a sign? We want these signs, don't we? The classic is Gideon. Remember Gideon? Uh, Gideon, listen to this in Judges 6, 37. 
Then Gideon said to, said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand. That's what God promised. I'll save Israel by your hand. And, and as Gideon says, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, God won't deceive us. His word is his bond. And yet Gideon goes on. Behold, I'm going to lay this fleece of wool down. I'm going to lay it down at night. And God, if I come in the morning and that fleece has dew on it, but there's no ground around it that's wet, I will know that surely you will save Israel by my hand. I mean, God is so gracious. He doesn't say, listen, just believe my word. Wakes up in the morning, runs out, comes to the fleece. It's not like just, you know, a little bit of water. It's, he wrung it out. There was so much water and it was dry everywhere else. I mean, Gideon still was hard. He said, oh Lord, look, forgive me, but I just want to make 100% sure that that was of you and that someone else didn't pour the water on that. So therefore, I'm going to put the fleece out again. And if this time the fleece is dry, but all around is wet, then I will 100% know that I, you will save Israel by my hand. And sure enough, he goes out and there it is. The fleece again is dry and it all is all around wet. And Abram is saying, look, Lord, can you give me a sign? that I will 100% know that I'll have this land. And, and he even goes a step further. It's like, don't just give me a sign. Give me a signed contract. Give me a signed contract. Put it in writing. Give it to me that I know that I will get that land. And God goes, okay, we'll do a contract. I want you to go and I want you to take five different animals. He says this, and I want you to get them and I want you to prepare them. He doesn't say go to the lawyer and write up the contract and the terms of reference and all these things and the obligations. He d said, get the animals, bring a heifer, three years old, bring a female uh, goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Abram knew exactly what was going on. He knew the score. He knew what God was requesting from him. This was the standard way of making contracts in those days. Take the animals, cut them in half, lay them out side by side, half and half. Let then the two people who are making the contract with its obligations, stipulations, walk through the middle of this. And if one of them fails to uphold the obligation, what they're saying is that I will be as one of those carcasses. I'll be dead if I don't abide by the contract. Uh, we make contracts in marriage. I'll do these things, you do those things. So Abram understood this. We, we see... Um, this very clearly shown in Jeremiah. Let me read this. Um, God had told, the, told Israel that every seven years you should free the slaves in your household. And so Zedekiah does this. But then later they renege and they take back their slaves. So listen to this. Verse 34, 18. The men of the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut into and pass between its parts. This is the standard way of making contracts in those days. Abram set the contract up. He thought that him and God somehow are going to walk through this and that he will obey and that God will deliver the land. So he waits. And he waits, and he waits. God, where are you? Like the bridegroom waiting for the, bri uh, the, the, bride, uh, the bride. Wait in, wait in. The cake is starting to look a bit off under the heavy lights. People are starting to leave. Then birds start to come down and start to try and feast on, this, um, on these carcasses. He's waiting and waiting. And then what happens is quite remarkable. Verse 12. A deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold... Dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Abram is now faced with the presence of God, but he is asleep. He's rendered inert. But then there's a deep darkness that comes upon him. Why is this? I wonder if it's not because the presence of God has come before Abram. This is the posture, or this is the scene that is faced by people, particularly in the Old Testament and the New, who faced God. They shook. They feared. Remember, Peter in the boat saw that Jesus was no other but God. And he said, get away from me, Lord. 
I am a sinner. And so here we have this God come in and it says in verse 17, Behold, the smoke in fire pot and a flaming torch pass between these pieces. We know who this is, the fire and the, the smoke. Israel, who this was written to before they went to the promised land, knew this. They were guided by the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. This is none other than God walking through the midst of this. Where's Abram? He's not doing anything. God himself walks through the middle of this and says, Abram, if I fail, my life's on the line. You will have the land. You will have the land. I will not fail you. My life is on the line if I do that. Abram was to wake up. He was to live the rest of his life trusting ultimately in the promise that would come, resting in the sign, in the contract, in the covenant that is made that God would be true and that he's to live his life not by sight but by faith, resting in the Lord whatever comes. Friends, God has made, if we could say, a contract with us. He has cut a contract, not with the, with the blood of bulls and goats, with the, but with the blood of his only son, we were, as Abram, asleep. But worse than that, in fact, we were dead in our trespasses and sins when Christ was put forward as a propitiation, one who would take away the sin of, our, of his people. On that cross, a covenant was made where he took upon your sin, crucified. The greatest sign there would ever be that we might live that we might live in light of that for now to eternity and that we don't get the blessing of offspring like Abram. We do not look to a land, but we have so much more, Hebrews 9.15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called, that's called savingly, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Friends, we have an eternal inheritance come in Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says that, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. We have the eternal reward. We have the eternal inheritance. We have the richness in Christ. We were dead. What is the riches? Forgiveness of sin, purpose for our life, peace with God, freedom from guilt and shame, righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ, and hope of eternity. And we had to live in light of that. It has been activated by his death. He's done it. He's cleared it. Now we have to rejoice in it. And this takes me to my last point here. Our covenant God honors his promises but not before delay and difficulties. I just wonder, as it says, darkness fell upon that moment, if it wasn't only the presence of a holy God, but it was the prospect of deep and long suffering that Abram and his people were going to experience. Because what it says between verses 13 and 16, that you will get the promise, but it's going to come through suffering. There will be 400 years of slavery that your people will go through, that they will be born, they'll live, they'll die, and they'll never get out of slavery. I'll be true to my promise, but there will be a long period of darkness, a long period of suffering until the sin of the Amorites is ripe for judgment. The years ahead are years of suffering, and those People in that time needed to live with the prospect that they will receive their eternal reward, but it might not be in their lifetime. And they were to be people who live by faith, trusting ultimately in God. Remember Joseph, as he uh, was thrown as a slave, taken to Egypt, he needed to live his life by faith. And he even said uh, before he died, take my bones into the promised land because God is going to give it to us. Moses would suffer as he is stripped of all his resources and cast upon the resources of God and God alone. 
Suffering then and suffering now always precedes glory and it is always the pathway to stronger faith. Friends, through suffering, we are being prepared for glory. The promise is fixed. It is yours. But there will be a time. It will be delay and there will be a time of suffering for God's people. And I don't know what this suffering looks like in your life. It might look very deep and dark. But be assured of this, that God will never deceive you. God will never lie. He's pinned his own son to the cross. He's written it in his own blood that we would live this life in the full assurance that we'll see him face to face for eternity. We're to follow God like that who condescended to come to us. Listen to Adoniram Judson. You know him? He was a missionary of the 19th century to Burma. He went there. He lost two wives and several children. He struggled for many years with very little fruit, if any fruit. A war broke out between the English and the Burmese, and he was English. Therefore, he was thrown into prison in atrocious conditions. He was struck with fear, a fever and sickness when his friend wrote to him and said, Judson, what's the outlook like? How's the outlook? Judson, in his classic reply, said the outlook is as bright as the promises of God. What was he looking for? He was looking for the eternal glory that God has signed with his own blood. And you might be in difficulties and struggles right now. And the call is turn to the living God. Repent of your doubts. Turn to him. Rest in him. He came to give promises to believers, not doubters, not skeptics. Know for certain that every one of God's promises that he has given you will come true. He will never deceive you, nor leave you, nor forsake you. Jesus shall reign and we shall reign with him. So no matter what your circumstances are, you can always say, the outlook is as bright as the promises of our covenant God toward us. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your phenomenal phenomenal grace upon our life. Lord, thank you that when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ redeemed us. Oh Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here who is not standing on the righteousness of Jesus Christ for their position before you, that they would flee to Christ, that they would simply repent of their sins, understand their very desperate state, and they'll look to the Lord Jesus, who is both God and man, promised Messiah, one who is to bring life and to bring life in abundance and receive him today. Oh Lord, but for all of us, Lord, we have a sure foundation that is written in your blood in a contract. Lord, we have the communion uh, meal, Lord, as a confirmation sign of that contract that we are to take until Christ comes again as that full assurance. Oh Lord, help us to live by faith this day and the days to come in delay and difficulty, trusting in your you, rejoicing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.